morning, everyone. I will call this hybrid meeting of the House Ways and Means Committee for May 4th to order. This hearing is taking place pursuant to Rule 10.01 and can also be viewed on the House webcast. Ms. Hanna, please take the roll. <laughs> Chair Moran. Vice Chair Olson. Present. Representative Garofalo. Present. Representative Albright. Present. Representative Becker Finn. Representative Bernardi. Present. Representative Eklund. Present. Representative Hansen. Present. Representative Hassan. Representative Hurtas. Present. Representative Hornstein. Hornstein present. Representative Johnson. Present. Representative Krisha. Present. Representative Liebling. Liebling present. Representative Lilly. Lilly present. Representative Mariani. Representative Marquardt. Present. Representative Miller. Present. Representative Nash. Present. Representative Nelson. Present. Representative Noor. Present. Representative O'Neill. Present. present. Okay. Representative Pulowski. Pulowski present. Representative Petersburg. Here. Representative Pinto. Present. Representative Schumacher. Thank you. Schumacher, yes. present. Representative Schultz. Schultz, present. Representative Scott. Here. Representative Sundin. Sundin, present. Okay. Representative Finn, Moran. Present. Present. Yeah. Representative Becker Finn. Becker Finn, present. Representative Fasan. And Representative Mariani. Madam Chair, a quorum is present. A quorum is present, and so our first order of business is approval of the minutes from our previous hearing. The minutes were provided in member packets and posted online. Can I get a motion for approval of the minutes? Madam Chair, I'll make that motion, but I do have a question about the minutes. Okay, go for it, Representative Garofalo. Wait, Madam Chair, I have not noticed this before, but uh, I didn't realize that we had abstentions in when we were voting. I thought that you were either I or nay or excused. I've, I've never noticed we have abstentions. Is that a new thing? Or? Great question, Representative Graffel. I'll actually ask uh, Mr. Sullivan if he could uh, <laughs> oh, oh, oh. <laughs> assist in what? this for abstentions on the minutes, uh, abstentions from votes. Uh, Madam Chair and members, I'm, I'm really not sure. That's not an issue that I've um, thought much about or looked into recently, so I'm sorry I can't be much help on that. Okay. Yeah, Madam Chair, I, 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 I'm, I'm not in favor nor against. Mm -hmm. I just I haven't noticed it before. I thought maybe We're giving you. Well, yeah, I, I could abstain from it too. I guess I could. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Representative Garofalo. We can certainly look into that and get back to you. <laughs> um, can I get a motion? Or you made the motion to approve the minutes as well, didn't you? Yes, Madam Chair. Okay. So the motion is before us. All those in favor of approval of the minutes, please say aye. 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 All those opposed, aye. please say nay. The motion prevails and the minutes are adopted. So we have two bills on the agenda today and we have um, a little less than an hour to get through those. But before we do that, we have to amend the budget resolution. So I will bring uh, the 2022 budget resolution coded BUD Res 04-2 as amended last week back before the committee. So we'll have Chair Moran, please proceed. Representative Miller. Uh, Madam Chair, I know that my report, Martine was saying there's problems with the sound. Are we sure it's all working properly? Okay. We'll take a moment. It is working now? Yeah, when the Zoom started, it was muted. Okay. Yeah. Sounds like we had um, some issues with the technology, but it's all up and running. So, Chair Moran, could you proceed with the budget resolution amendment? Madam Chair, she's muted. Oh, she is muted. So, Chair Moran, if you'd like to unmute, please. You know, Madam Chair, Representative Moran and I talked last Representative night about this. Garofalo. And she mentioned that her budget resolution, what she wanted to do was on page one, she wanted to reduce the total amount of money for the general fund, and then she wanted to increase the amount for the Workforce Development Fund. And Representative Garofalo will let her come off mute and explain the budget resolution amendment. I just thought you'd, if you want to move it and pass it, you can. Representative 
uh, we'll hold, so Chair Moran's having some technology difficulties there, so we'll hold for just a second here. the resolution if you want to move it it's okay. We're not gonna... Okay, great. So we will go ahead and we will um it seems like she's having some technology difficulties. So with um, Representative Madam Chair, Pro oh, Madam there Chair, she is. I'm, yep. Thank you. I am I am so sorry. I have I am having some technical problems. But I would like to bring the 2022 budget resolution code at Buzz Red 04-2 as amended last week back before the committee. So okay. members- Chair Marianne, would, like would you explain uh, the A01 amendment? Yeah, so the A01 amendment does two things. It decreases the net general fund spending by 311 million, which in part reflects the lower spending contained in the UI frontline worker conference committee passed into law. And it increases the target for workforce development by 161.7 million. So on the associated spreadsheet, in addition to those two changes, I will also note that additional bills have been added in the other bills category to account for bills that have passed or moved out to the floor since the last revision. So I would defer to Mr. Hagerler Meyer for additional explanation if he would like to comment. Mr. Hagemeyer, do you have anything <laughs> further to add? Madam Chair, I think uh, Chair Moran summarized that very nicely. Great, thank you. Great, so do we have any uh, discussion to the A01 amendment? Representative O'Neill. Thank you, Madam Chair, just very quickly. I know this is not a, a tails target, but I would point out that we are uh, overspending. Um, they will have a problem when we come back next biennium by $1.32 billion. F further discussion to the A01 amendment. Chair Moran, any final word on the A01 amendment? Uh, no, let's go to a vote. Okay, very good. So the A1 amendment is before us. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 All those aye. opposed, please say nay. No. The motion prevails and the amendment is adopted. So next we're on to our bills for uh, today. So the first is House File 2725. Representative Edelson, and I believe it's going to be co-presented with Representative Albright. Welcome to the committee, Representative Edelson. So members, this bill has been through three different committees and came to us from the Judiciary, Finance, and Civil Law Committee. Rep Representative Albright is the second author. So would you like to move that House File 2725 be recommended for placement on the General Register to get the bill before the committee? Madam Chair, that is my motion. Great. And Rep Representative Edelson, I understand that the bill has been a work in progress and you have a couple of author's amendments to get the bill in the shape you would like to present it. So Representative Albright, would you like to move the DE3 amendment for the author? Madam Chair, I would move the DE3 amendment before the committee. Wonderful, great. So Representative Albright and Representative Edelson, please explain the amendment um, and then you have one more amendment as well. Do you wanna move that at the same time? Or do you want to explain the DE3 first? Madam Chair, I think it would be appropriate if we explain the bill first uh, because the uh, conversation would be pertinent to DE3 and then we'll move the A3 after that. Okay, sounds great. So go ahead and explain the DE3 and then we'll make sure to get the A3 before us after we do that description. So Representative Edelson. Madam Chair and members, the DE3 um, represents the compromise agreement with language changes that we had. So I would, we would appreciate member support of this bill. Further discussion to the DE3. 
Okay, so we will move to the A3 amendment to the D3. Representative Albright, would you move that amendment? Madam Chair, I'd move the A3 amendment at this time. Great. So, Representative Albright and uh, Edelson, please go ahead and explain the amendment to the amendment. Madam Chair, the A3 amendment is the fiscal side of the uh, appropriation uh, for House File 2725. Uh, this comes uh, after a concerted effort in understanding the mechani mechanisms that uh, abound in 2725, and uh, it reflects the revised fiscal note that we have before the committee this morning. Great. So we have the A3 amendment to the DE3 amendment. Discussion to that. Okay. All those in favor of the A3, please say aye. 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 All those opposed, aye. please say nay. The motion prevails and the amendment to the amendment is adopted. Thank you, Madam so, Chair. Thank you. So you can proceed with your uh, discussion. Thanks, Representative Edelson. Thank you, Madam Chair and members. Good morning. House Bill 2725 is a result of comprehensive work done by the Community Competency Restoration Task Force that was created by the legislature in 2019. This included 25 members of appointees that were, organized, were organizations and government entities that included the Sheriff's Association, NAMI, County Attorney, State Court Administration, DHS, the Board of Public Defense, counties, amongst others. I want to specifically thank Sue Abder Holden from NAMI, as well as Ryan Flynn from the County Attorney's Office, who is here today. They have done, their collaboration in this process has been invaluable. The issue this bill seeks to address are gap cases. This is when a person commits a crime but is not competent to stand trial, but also does not meet civil commitment standards. A judge may currently order treatment, but there is no oversight program to ensure that a person adheres to this order. The, judge, the judges are limited in, a way, in many ways, including ordering medication. This bill seeks to fill that gap. We have a gap in treatment and public safety in the state of Minnesota, and this brings uh, this is a bridge to, to that gap. This legislation will absolutely protect public safety as well as the gap in treatment. We have heard from judges, county attorneys, law enforcement, therapists and clinics, hospitals and treatment staff. All who have seen gap cases <coughs> through come through a revolving door, in one day, out the next, back a week later. Family members asking for, have been asking for help. The court system is unable to respond in a way that is meaningful because of the lack of infrastructure that we have in the state of Minnesota. I spoke with one judge off the record that said, please do anything you can to help us. We are doing, what we are doing now costs our state a great deal due to the strain on this overall system that is not set up to help people. Madam Chair, I would like to yield my time to Representative Albright, my partner and co-author in this important legislation. Thank you. Representative Albright. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, and members, the legislation before you this morning seeks to address what we know as gap cases uh, by doing the following. Establishing standards to assess a person's competency to stand trial and, pro and process for restoring a person to competency. Creates a board for competency restoration and a position of forensic navigators to work with defendants in the competency process and develop plans to connect defendants to appropriate services. This, bo this, this board mirrors that of the uh, uh, Guardian Ad Litem's board. The legislation also gives judges more discretion to order treatment and medication. The navigators created within this legislation would ensure orders and treatment are being followed. This is absolutely an issue as a state that we must address. As many of you have seen over the uh, previous several months, Carol Levin has done many stories on gap cases that are heartbreaking. And again, this evening, another story will be coming out about a man who lost his life because a neighbor ran him over. The same man who was provisionally discharged weeks earlier. This man would have met the qualifications to have support provided to him had the Navigator program that is inherent to this bill had been in place. There are many, many stories uh, such as this of people left behind, people, families asking for help that have not been addressed. There are many changes to this legislation. There have been many changes to this legislation that have occurred over the past four months. And today what sits before you is a better bill because of the feedback that we have received from the members of this committee 
and the other members of the committees that it has passed through and from the stakeholders who are many and have been already identified. The preliminary fiscal implications to establish this infrastructure to, for our state are as follows. An estimated 9.5 million for forensic navigator staff, company restoration of board staff, which will include two managers and eight supervisors. The total cost of the forensic navigator program is $11.3 million for the first year and each subsequent year the program will be estimated to cost $10.9 million. There is also a $5 million appropriation for additional competency exams, which the court will receive through these funds. Members, we will stand for correction, uh, uh, questions, uh, but I would yield back to my co-author, Representative Edelson, to complete our presentation. Thank you. Representative Edelson. Thank you, Madam Chair and members. The fiscal note before you um, left out the cost of competency restoration education, and I just want to alert members to that. We did have a call yesterday to uh, discuss this. There was three point million, which was projected, um, but the we assumed that was on the high side, thirty five hundred dollars. Uh, each for each person to go through this education. We thought the estimate was high after consulting with county attorneys, DHS, NAMI. We had a call yesterday. There was consensus with that. We believe some of the other assumptions are on the high side as well. So we decided that the amount that we have within this bill is a great place for us to get started to fill this gap. Um, so the 11.3 million will be enough, we believe. We wanna thank members um, on this body, specifically uh, Jamie Becker-Finn, uh, Chair Becker-Finn, uh, uh, Chair Johnson, and um, let's see who else is on here, Representative Scott as well, I know that are on this committee for all of their work and feedback, as well as Representative O'Neill, I know that this is an issue you care about as well. So with that, Madam Chair, we stand for questions. Thank you for the presentation and uh, all of your work. I know this was a work in progress up to the last minute. So thank you for uh, everything you're doing uh, regarding this issue. So members, the revised fiscal note is in the packet and as amended, this bill has no impact on the budget resolution. So just wanna make members aware of that. So questions and discussion to the DE3 as amended, Representative Miller. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. And um, knowing the work that it takes to have all the stakeholders on the table, know the work so my questions are meant to be gent gentle um, and, and the one question I have is not exactly fiscal but since this is the first time I've seen it's a simple question I hope you give me some latitude um, this bill I'm sure it's because it was a compromise work with a state with the stakeholders but it's an incredibly prescriptive bill like it basically spells out what you're going to do and how you're going to do it typically we empower an agency or a couple agencies and then they kind of put the things together. So I just want to be clear on this, that the, the people that are going to be doing this work in state government, they're, they're good with what they're seeing here. That's a, I guess that, that is a question. I hope you heard my question. Is that, is the, are they okay with that? Representative Edelson. Uh, Representative or Chair Olson, Representative Miller, um, we are creating a, an absolutely new uh, navigator is a position that doesn't exist. So um, unfortunately, we we felt we needed to be prescriptive in this um, to make sure that we we knew exactly what uh, this this job would entail. So yes, all the stakeholders are in agreement that this is what um, the navigator and the navigator board, our competency restoration board, would be tasked with um, because this is the gap that we are seeing right now in our current system. Okay. Representative Miller. Thanks, Madam Chair. And, and I'm okay with that. I just know that my experience with criminal law and such, mm -hmm. they they tend to not like us telling them how to do it. And and actually to my frustration as a commentary, there are times where we can't get things done because they say, well, it doesn't work this way, and then they don't do anything about it. So I appreciate that you had to be prescriptive I just as long as people are on board. My fiscal question. You sort of answered this, Representative Edelson, um, but this is the Ways and Means Committee and we have an undefined appropriations in this. I know we have a fiscal note and I heard that you say that we're, um, you know, you have a pretty good feel for what it is that you're going to be needing for this. And so I'm okay with that, but I will tell you that if we're going before Ways and Means and approving money, if you will, through this committee, we should probably know what it is that we're approving. I'm not gonna make a big deal about it now, but I 
I'm a little bit uncomfortable, but not a lot of bit uncomfortable with that. So just I would assume and appreciate but that by the time this gets to the floor and we speak about it on the floor, you'll have that number. You'll have that by then. Representative Edelson, and I just note that we did adopt the A3 already, which it, maybe you'll oh, talk maybe, a little maybe bit maybe about I that. that part so of go it. ahead. And I um, thought they said, go ahead, go ahead. Madam Chair, Representative, uh, Representative Milk, the A3 actually identifies the appropriate The actual number. Itself. I apologize. <clears throat> kind of over missed that. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Representative Scott. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. And um, there's no doubt that something needs to be done about um, this issue. And um, just over the interim, met with some count, the county, some county attorneys, met with DHS. Um, kind of nobody wanted to take responsibility for this. Um, and so my question right now is, um, who who is responsible? right now for when DHS provisionally discharges someone. Is that addressed in this bill? Because I didn't see it. Representative Edelson. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Representative Scott, right now, uh, if a person's provisionally discharged, um, they, they may not actually have uh, following. Um, however, in the bill before you, if that happens, a navigator would be appointed at that point. Um, so there would be a following, which is, is uh, again, a, a part of the gap that we're trying to um, build a bridge to. Okay. Thank thank I just, I want, thank you, Madam Chair. I just wanted to make sure that the committee was aware of that. Um, Representative Edelson, how many navigators um, do you expect to hire with the amount um, in the fiscal note here that's uh, allotted for that? Representative Edelson? Uh, Repres or Chair, uh, Chair Olson, Representative Scott, uh, the fiscal note um, appropriates, uh, puts enough for 127 FTE um, forensic navigators. And I, I do, um, as I had mentioned in the opening comments, I do think that's uh, high necessarily, but we are again balancing out the fact that um, the educational component is not. So we, in one of the amendments we adopted, we um, made sure that the appropriation, the funds that we are allocating could be used for educational purposes as well as staff. Uh, 127 would be the number. We have 10 ju ju judicial districts. That would be 12 per ju judicial district. But I, I think um, some areas will obviously do more than others. Representative Scott. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. And Representative Edelson, could you tell the committee approximately how many people um, per year you're expecting um, that might go through this process? How many folks that might fall in this category? Representative Albright. Thank you, Madam Chair. I, I just want to back up a little bit and, 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 and add a little uh, color to the previous question by Representative Scott before I answer her next question. One of the things about this uh, uh, program that uh, we all re recognize is that uh, this is a, a new build out of uh, a program that will take time. And so the fiscal note recognizes the full build out of that. Uh, we would anticipate that the first year will be uh, spent with uh, an immense amount of effort being put into what that uh, forensic navigator curricula looks like, as well as the type of positions and people that would fill those. Uh, the full build out is it will take some time. Uh, so just recognizing that. To the point of her next question, about the number of people that we would anticipate uh, seeing walk through this program. It's roughly about 1,100 people. Representative Scott. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. And thank you for that, um, Representative Albright and Representative Edelson. Um, I do have uh, a question on line 11.11 .11 through 11.12. And it's speaking to when they're going to, um, you know, discharge uh, one of these individuals, um, and it, it lists all the people that need to be notified, the, um, the prosecutor, defense counsel, any entity responsible for the supervision of the defendant prior to any planned discharge. And I wonder if any thought was given to, if there's a victim um, in this case, in these cases, if the victims, um, we might want to add something there about the victims being notified that this person is going to be released. 
Representative Edelson or Representative Albright. Thank you, Madam Chair, and, and to the and thank you for the question, Representative Scott. And that would be up and charged uh, with responsibility of the prosecutor. Representative Scott. Uh, okay, um, thanks. And um, just some kind of well, one that one last question, then a comment. Um, is there current curriculum? There, this bill talks a lot about curriculum that these um, navigators will be trained in. Is there current curriculum that is being used, or, or is that going to be something that has to come from scratch as well? Representative Albright. Thank you, Madam Chair. Representative Scott, there is a skeleton of, of a curricula that would be used based upon uh, conversations with other states. Uh, it is not as robust as we as a state would like to see it, and so that's where we will start from and build that out uh, going forward. Representative Scott. Thank you, Madam Chair, and, and thank you, Representative Albright and Representative Edelson. Um, I think this is a really important um, work that's been done. I do have concerns that we're, we're biting off an awful lot um, and, and expect this, um, all the... the um, the ducks to be in a row by January, which seems like a really short period of time for something that kind of as complex as this. I'm also concerned um, with our current um, workforce shortage that we're gonna be able to find people to fill the positions of navigators that are needed. Um, so I, I think it's a good start and at a very minimum, um, you know, if, if, if we don't reach that January deadline, I think something needs to be in place to kind of to fill the gap for the gap cases. And maybe just requiring DHS at least to follow up on these people um, might be kind of a, a plan B, if you will, um, if we aren't able to get everything in place. Um, thank you, Madam Chair, for allowing me to ask my question. Representative Johnson. Chair Olson, Representative Edelson, Representative Albright, I wanna thank you for this bill. Law enforcement has been screaming for help for decades. Um, in my career, I can name the uh, eight to 10 people that we dealt with every month that this program would have worked. We knew their names, their date of birth, um, everything. Just, just by a description, we knew who we were going to be seeing because it was a revolving door. Usually every three to six months, we were dealing with these individuals. Um, I like the concept that's going on here. I hope it works. I, I do believe we need to watch it close. Uh, because in the next couple of years, we're, we're probably going to have to do some tweaks to it because we want to make sure that we're doing it right. But I want to thank you for uh, tackling this very difficult subject. Um, the only concern I have is on this dealing with the medications, uh, with the Jarvis ruling, how that's going to apply to make sure that these individuals are taking their medications. Representative O'Neill. <clears throat> thank you, Madam Chair. Um, thank you both for bringing this forward. Um, I'm trying to do a quick side-by-side. -side. I'm a little uncomfortable doing such a massive DE in Ways and Means. I know we do it. I'm really, really uncomfortable with it. This is every single word in this bill really, really matters. And I would point to uh, in the DE line 3.1 through 3.8 when we're changing the definition of what mental illness is considered, which is literally the trigger for this entire program, and I see that you've drastically changed, in my view, drastically changed the definition from the underlying bill to the DE. Um, again, I don't really want to talk about all this stuff in ways and means because we don't I, we don't have a lot of our experts that we should have here when we're talking about doing big uh, sweeping changes to the bill. But if you could just briefly explain uh, the change between the the prior definition of mental illness and the current definition of mental illness, because again, this is one of the most critical parts of the bill, because that's the trigger for them to start this process. Representative Edelson. Chair Olson, Representative O'Neill. Uh, the mental illness definition was agreed upon with clinicians, as well as NAMI, as well as county attorneys, and just finding middle ground on this. I do know that uh, Ms. Abderholden is on the call if, if, we, if we wanted to ask her to expand upon that. Uh, Ms. Abderholden from NAMI, are you on the call and would you like to comment on the definition of mental illness? Madam Chair, I do not see her on the call. Okay, uh, Representative Edelson. Chair Edel, uh, or excuse me, Chair Olson. Um, I also have Elliot here from NAMI that could probably come up and speak to this. Okay. 
Great. Welcome to the committee. Please introduce yourself for the record. Thank you, Madam Chair. Elliot Butai. I'm the Criminal Justice Coordinator at NAMI Minnesota. Um, and yes, we did work with clinicians, uh, forensic psychologists on the definition. Um, it is a, I think it's a very specific definition because the law says that um, if a person's found incompetent due to a mental illness or a cognitive impairment, so we need to be really clear about those things and sometimes they do get um, messy with substance use disorder or, um, so I think it just has to be a very <clears throat> pointed definition to match with the law and what the examiners are looking for. Representative O'Neill. Thank you, Madam Chair. <clears throat> uh, no, I, I can see that in the definition change. I guess what I'm asking is, you went from diagnostic codes published by the Commissioner of Human Services, which is very defined, to a much less defined in some ways, um, to being a little more broad as to what mental illness is, but then you were more explicit as to what mental illness is not. And I'm wondering if you could just uh, tell us now who is included. Because that's really important, because that's the trigger for to start this whole process is that that's a finding. Uh, Mr. Madam Butai. Chair, Representative uh, O'Neill. Um, yeah, I, I, you know, I might need to check with the clinicians, honestly. I do, I do think that broadening it makes it catch more people um, rather than tying it to the diagnostic codes. Um, it's not my understanding that a person actually has to be diagnosed. It just has to be um, the, the, the examiner just needs to determine that, that they're incompetent uh, for one reason or another. Um, so yeah, I, I think I would have to get back to you, actually. Um, Madam, Madam Chair. Representative Albright. Madam Chair and uh, uh, Representative O'Neill, one of the facets of, of, of to your question about re the codes that uh, recognize the previous mental health uh, definition, those pertain more to reimbursement in terms of for insurance coverage mm -hmm. as well as diagnostic uh, appreciation for what next steps uh, would pertain to that patient as they present themselves in a medical setting. Uh, when we're dealing with a person who, again, presents themselves in front of a court of law, uh, that definition sometimes does not uh, reckon uh, with uh, the, 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 the dilemma uh, that a court system might uh, be presented with uh, as a person who has been charged with a specific offense. Um, uh, ICD codes uh, don't typically work as well in a, a judicial setting as they would in a medical setting. And so broadening that uh, to uh, Mr. Boutet's uh, 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 remarks uh, encompass a broader uh, number of individuals who are not looking for reimbursement for a treatment per se at that time, but they're looking for an identification in terms of what next steps necessarily need to be taken in order to recognize whether or not they are uh, able to stand for competency, uh, are competent and able to stand for trial uh, for the offenses charged with them or not. And in this case, what we're trying to do is avail uh, as many people as possible to uh, not only their uh, due process rights, uh, but also to medical treatment that would uh, enable them uh, to find the help and the treatment that they uh, might need. Uh, in order to stand trial or to move forward in the process of evaluation. And I'll just remind members not to stymie conversation, or so, we'll, but just as an awareness that we have a hard stop uh, shortly before 9.30, and so <coughs> just, just for awareness. So Representative O'Neill. Thank you, Madam Chair. No, I, I completely understand that, and that is why I am really uncomfortable with these massive DEs that come in that have big policy. If, if the policy was essentially the same and they were just changing the numbers, I would have less of a concern. But when I see this big change to the definition of mental illness coming to ways and means, I have a problem with that. Um, I won't belabor that point anymore. Um, I'm not necessarily disagreeing with this because I just wanted to know who is included, right? I mean, it's, it's in, in the underlying bill, it's specific to diagnostic codes, which I understand is very, very broad. The DSM-5 is very, very broad. Um, probably most of us in this room would have some categoriz categorization from DSM-5. That is not who you're trying to capture. I understand that. But um, I think that this isn't the place to make that big sweeping change. That's all I'm saying. Um, 
I also wanted to talk about um, the targeted misdemeanor. If you could just briefly explain, because that's another really important thing that uh, especially Representative Albright and I have talked about when it comes to a, a bill that I had done regarding what happened in my community. Um, I'm not going to go into that whole story, but the short answer is somebody that was mentally incompetent to stand trial, was not held accountable, did not go before the court, there was not a finding of mental incompetence, so he was legally able to possess a firearm and killed somebody. So I want to make absolutely sure that in this bill, and I realize targeted misdemeanor would cover his specific case and others like him, and it's a little bit more broad than that as well, which I do appreciate. Um, but can you just walk through very briefly the process of somebody with a misdemeanor? Because that seems to be something that is lost the most. People with misdemeanors, and when they're, when there's a, a report that comes back of a finding of mental, not a finding, there's a report of mental incompetence to stand trial, there's not a judicial finding, and the misdemeanor is dismissed, and they just sort of go off into the world, and we don't know where they are, what they're doing, and they are a legal they are legally able to possess a firearm unless there's another court order to the contrary. Um, so can you just briefly talk about what this bill does in that situation with someone that has like a violation of HRO or OFP or Danko that triggers a misdemeanor and what does this do differently than what's happening right now? Representative Edelson. Uh, Madam Chair, Representative O'Neill. So the misdemeanors we initially started off with being included within this bill. Um, however, throughout the process, uh, we looked at other states. Um, DHS specifically had saw that the, just including misdemeanors by themselves was actually not as productive and it, it, it actually diluted the program to some extent. So what we did here is we, we do include targeted misdemeanors, which um, just so everybody knows, targeted misdemeanors would be maybe a, a domestic assault, a fifth degree assault. Um, driving while impaired, something of that nature. So with that, um, we have included those. And in that instance, there would be a, a navigator that would be appointed for targeted misdemeanors. Now, what happened, um, Representative O'Neill, in your, in, your, um, in Buffalo, I, I genuinely am trying to figure that out. I have uh, Mrs. Haas is here, and she knows, as well as Mr. Flynn from the County Attorney's Association. We are trying to figure out what happened um, in your uh, situation and what happened in, in your uh, city. But I, I can't speak to it. I don't have all of the details. Representative O'Neill. Thank you, Madam Chair. Well, I did have a conversation with them before uh, coming to the committee. And uh, I'm not going to, I mean, we can have an offline conversation about what actually happened in my district. But from my reading and from talking with the experts, it seems that it does cover that situation. Um, it's not as direct. Of, of a, with my bill, it's not as direct, but I think it gets there. And I think what's more important is that all city and county attorneys will be going through an education process and understand the gravity of those decisions um, if they are just going to dismiss based on a report and not allow the court to have a judicial finding because it's the judicial finding that triggers the prohibited person statute. And that's what did not happen. And I believe that through this process, the court will now be making a finding of mental incompetence. That triggers everything. It triggers, triggers uh, the navigator. It triggers prohibited person. So someone that truly is dangerous mm -hmm. will not be allowed to purchase and possess uh, weapons. Mm -hmm. So I believe that this covers it. Um, I believe that's what they had told me uh, offline. But um, again, we've got some pretty big changes in the DE, so I haven't had, a, had the chance to dig in really, really deep. I know it's pertained, it's uh, discussed on page four and page eight, and um, I believe it gets to that concern that my community has. And obviously that's not a unique situation. Mm -hmm. So you, as we have more and more challenges in the courts with those with mental illness of all different types, it is a growing problem. So I, I believe it is addressed, but thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Representative Becker Finn. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. And I, I just wanted to, for the record, uh, this was, I think, the only bill we did this with in the Judiciary and Civil Law Committee, where we I actually had this bill come back to us twice. Um, so it started out with us, it went um, to some other committees and then came back to us because it is a big deal. And we did recognize um, how important this was. And so I, I did want to, you know, for folks who don't serve on judiciary to for folks to know that we we did vet this bill quite a bit um, because it is that important. Um, and then just wanted to you know say that 
I think um, right now the current system is not working. We, we can ag all agree that the current system as it is, is not working. And every year that we wait to do something, we are going to have more of these cases of, of these gap cases. And um, frankly, you know, preventable bad things from happening to people. And so I think um, this bill is a really great example of, you know, I, I think Representative Edelson, Representative Albright, very much a, uh, you know, it's a nonpartisan issue. And so there is bipartisan work being done uh, to fix this problem. Um, is it a perfect bill? No, none of our bills are perfect, but it, it's a good bill. And I think it'll definitely move us in the right direction. And I, I hope that folks can support it today. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. And we have two more members on the list and then we'll move to a vote after that so that we have time to do uh, Chair Murphy's bill today as well. So Representative Hurtas. Well, thank you, Madam Chair, and uh, thank you, Representatives Adelson and Albright, for addressing this issue. I've heard so often uh, from many of my local uh, police departments uh, the issues of catch and release and recidivism. Uh, we've all tried to do things uh, in our time here. Uh, I also can share a story like Representative O'Neill with regard to things that happen in your own district and the loss of life because people should not have been on the street. Um, a question I have with regard to the navigators and the assumptions uh, in this report, um, obviously it, it makes some assumptions about 87 counties and 25% of uh, county jails might uh, have programs or whatnot. I would presume that there's a mechanism to make sure that the allocation of resources uh, provides some continuity uh, throughout the state. Um, we have you know, our most populous counties right here in the metro, seven county metro region, and I would presume, uh, and correct me if I'm wrong, that probably m much of the resources would be dedicated uh, here in the, in the metro region, but I am concerned about uh, mental illness has no boundaries, and certainly uh, in rural areas, there's going to be needs as well. So I, I'm presuming that these uh, individuals would be transferred to these jails, which have become our mental health institutions over the last several decades since the closure of state hospitals. And so um, I guess I just was wondering if you could just address a little bit how the program will be somewhat uniformly uh, allocated so that the entire state uh, can get help rather than just maybe where the most amount of people live. Representative Albright, just please. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, Representative uh, Hurtas, thank you for the question. I, I think the one dynamic that uh, we wanted to make sure uh, was embodied in the legislation in the DE was a recognition that no two uh, counties are the same and no two uh, areas of the state are the same or similar. And so uh, while we are developing a, a, a template uh, via uh, curriculum as well as uh, the, the foundational elements for these uh, forensic navigators and also the recognition for the court system and uh, the county-based uh, health services to be aware of these services. Each one of the uh, counties uh, will very likely create its own system and its own means of providing for these uh, 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 services. Uh, and, and with the understanding that they may expand or contract based upon the demand uh, placed upon them. Uh, we recognize that there are, if you will, uh, hot spots within the state that will require more services versus those that may not require or may share those services with other counties. And so that the fluidity uh, of, of the resources available to the counties is very much a part of the DE. Great, thank you. So Representative Garofalo. Um, thank you, Madam Chair and uh, Representative Edelson. Um, you and Representative Albright have done a good job laying out the need for these services. Um, as the chair correctly mentioned, uh, there's no impact on the budget resolution, but it is in the tails. I'm just wondering, has anyone had any conversations about budgetary offsets to pay for this? Any other cuts in other areas? Representative Albright. Thank you, Madam Chair and Representative Graffel. That will be a conversation that we will undertake, but at this time we have not done so. Okay. Thank you, Madam Chair. Okay, seeing no further, and I know you've worked really hard on this and want to see it moving, so we'll just proceed to a vote if that's okay with, uh, with both of you. Madam Chair, brevity is our friend right now, so thank you for hearing <laughs> the bill. Thank you. Thank you very much. So seeing no further discussion, we still need to adopt the amendment as amended. So all those in favor of the amended amendment, please say aye. 
Aye. Aye. Aye. All those Aye. opposed, please say no. No. The amendment is adopted. So to see no further discussion on the bill is amended, I will renew uh, the original motion that House File 4670 as amended be recommended for placement on the general register. So Ms. Borgerdang. Excuse please. me. Oh. Ms. Madam Chair, you just said the 4670 and we're on 2725. I'm a, I apologize. I was looking ahead. So 2725 as amended is uh, before us and so be recommended for placement on the general register. So House File 2725 as amended. Vice Chair Olson. Aye. Chair Moran. Representative Garofalo. Garofalo, no. Garofalo, no. Representative Albright. Aye. Albright, aye. Representative Becker Finn. Aye. Becker Finn, aye. Representative Bernardi. Sorry. Aye. Bernardi, aye. Representative Eklund. Aye. Eklund, aye. Representative Hansen. Aye. Hansen, aye. Representative Fasan. <laughs> Representative Hurtas. Hurtas, aye. Hurtas, aye. Representative Hornstein. Hornstein, aye. Hornstein, aye. Representative Johnson. Aye. Johnson, aye. Representative Krisha. Krisha, aye. Krisha, aye. Representative Liebling. Liebling, aye. Liebling, aye. Representative Lily. Lily, aye. Lily, aye. Representative Mariani. Representative Marcourt. Aye. Marcourt, aye. Representative Miller. Miller, aye. Miller, aye. Representative Nash. Nash, aye. Nash, aye. Representative Nelson. Nelson, aye. Nelson, aye. Representative Noor. No, aye. Noor, aye. Representative O'Neill. O'Neill, no. O'Neill, no. Representative Plowski. Plowski, aye. Plowski, aye. Representative Petersburg. Aye. Petersburg, aye. Representative Pinto. Aye. Pinto, aye. Representative Schumacher. Schumacher, aye. Schumacher, aye. Representative Schultz. Schultz, aye. Schultz, aye. Representative Scott. Aye. Scott, aye. Representative Sundin. Sundin, aye. Sundin, aye. Aye. Chair Moran. Aye. Moran, aye. Representative Hassan. Hassan excused. Hassan excused. And Representative Mariani. Madam Chair, that is 25 ayes and two nays. There being 25 ayes and two nays, the motion prevails in House File 2725 as amended is recommended for placement on the general register. So thank you both and uh, you're on your way. Thank you, Madam Chair. Members. So the final bill on the calendar for or on our agenda for today is House File 4670, which is the claims bill. We have about 10 minutes to get through this, so we will um, try to proceed expeditiously. Um, so as the chair move, makes her way up to the table, I will move that House File 4670 be recommended for placement on the general register. And there is also, also an author's amendment, so I'll also move the A22-0460 amendment. So uh, welcome to the committee, uh, Chair Murphy, and we appreciate you being here and, and getting this bill in in the last 10 minutes here. So uh, if you go ahead and explain the 046 amendment, uh, and then we'll get the bill in the shape that you would like and proceed. Thank you, Madam Chair, members of the committee. Um, the Claims Committee is a subcommittee of the Legislative Coordinating Commission, which is made up of members of both the House and the Senate. And this Claims Subcommittee usually just considers the claims that have been made to the state in the Department of Corrections and Department of Human Services or any agency, um, but predominantly human services and corrections. There are many claims about, a bill is usually, or the claims are usually um, brought to us in binders about three weeks before the claims committee is, subcommittee is to meet the first time of the year. And it is up to the three members of the House and the three members of the Senate to review those claims that have been made by usually um, 
people that are uh, served by the Department of Corrections and the Department of Human Services. And in some way or another, the individuals that did not receive the proper service of their belongings. And so there's a lot of tennis shoes that have been stolen or lost. There's TVs that are broken or lost. There are just personal items, books that they had and then disappeared. Pages and pages in these huge binders. And the subcommittee picks the ones that are recommended to them by our council. And our council the, to the subcommittee is Reviser Jason Keenly and at the present time. Er, and um, he works with someone from the Department of Corrections and someone from the Department of Human Services that have pre-reviewed pre and made recommendations to the subcommittee. And then in one or two meetings, the subcommittee meets and decides how they're, which cases they're going to take and which they're not. Last year, I was caught unaware. Excuse me. Chair Murphy, would you mind speaking to, I know we're on a time crunch and I know you want to get your bill out of here and not have to come back. So will yes. you speak to the Dash 0460 amendment, make sure we get that covered. Yes. Thank you. Because last year, I was taken aback on the floor of the House when I presented the bill because there was questions about the process that were made. And the LCC has done nothing about addressing the process. And certainly, the subcommittee can't do that. <coughs> and so, as a result of that, yesterday, I was right on time. I went down to the representative that had um, suggested that the process should be corrected. Um, last year and said, we have the claims bill up again tomorrow and I need to know right now if, or today, uh, if we're going to have the same problem that existed, even though all the claims from last year and all the claims from this year are, were in the bill and unanimously voted for by the subcommittee. Um, and I got back, um, I got back, or the person I talked with got back to me later and said, yes, we have a problem. The problem still exists that existed last spring. And so we have no problem with the exonerations. And so the amendment is before you to approve the exoneration reports of the three people that made their case before the subcommittee and the subcommittee um, would like that. And I would like the amendment to pass so those three cases can be settled. Very good. So any discussion to the amendment? Seeing no further discussion, all those in favor say aye. Aye. All those opposed say nay. The amendment is adopted and the amended bill is before us. Any discussion to the bill as amended? Seeing no discussion, a like 30 second closing last word, Chair Murphy. <laughs> Thank you very much for your consideration. <laughs> Great, wonderful. Thank you. I apologize for the rush, but I think we're going to get it done. So we will, I will renew my motion that House file, oh, make sure I get this right. House file 4670 as amended be recommended for placement on the general register. So Ms. Borgerding, please take the roll. Vice Chair Olson. Aye. Olson, aye. Chair Moran. Aye. Moran, aye. Representative Groffalo. Pass. Representative Groffalo, pass. Representative Albright. Aye. Albright, aye. Representative Becker-Finn. Aye. Becker-Finn, aye. Representative Bernardi. Aye. Bernardi, aye. Representative Eckland. Aye. Eckland, aye. Representative Hansen. Aye. Hansen, aye. Representative Hassan. Oh, Hassan, excuse. Representative Hurtas. Aye. Hurtas, aye. Representative Hornstein. 
Aye. Bornstein, aye. Representative Johnson? Aye. Johnson, aye. Representative Krisha? Krisha, aye. Krisha, aye. Representative Liebling? Aye. Liebling, aye. Representative Lilly? Lily, aye. Lily, aye. Representative Mariani, excused. Representative Marquardt? Aye. Marquardt, aye. Representative Miller? Aye. Miller, aye. Representative Nash? Nash, no. Nash, no. Representative Nelson? Nelson, aye. Nelson, aye. Representative Noor? Noor, aye. Noor, aye. Representative O'Neill? Aye. O'Neill, aye. Representative Pulaski? Pulaski, aye. Pulaski, aye. Representative Petersburg? Aye. Petersburg, aye. Representative Pinto? Aye. Pinto, aye. Representative Schumacher? Schumacher, aye. Schumacher, aye. Representative Schultz? Schultz, aye. Schultz, aye. Representative Scott? Aye. Scott, aye. Representative Sundin? Sundin, aye. Sundin, aye. And Representative Graflow? Graflow, no. Graflow, no. Madam Chair, that is 25 ayes and two nays. There being 25 ayes and two nays, the motion prevails and House File 4670, as amended, is recommended for placement on the General Register. And with that, members, we have no further business, and there are no other meetings scheduled for this week, so just watch your emails in case anything comes up. And with that, we are adjourned.